Of course, reading data is only the first step. In order to get value out of your data, you must start processing it. We will do so by showing some of the most common selecting, filtering, and sorting commands. This is what would translate to your select, where, and sort commands in SQL, only distributed. So we are already connected to a Spark cluster, and we are inside an interactive Python shell. I haven't entered any commands yet. To test the new commands, we will once again read in the Titanic dataset that resides as a CSV file on our file system. So we're going to read in the CSV file and save it under Titanic. And we say spark.read.format CSV. Then we bring in some line breaks. And the first option we set is separ separator is a comma. Second option we set is the header is true. And infer schema is also true. So you should be familiar with those commands. If not, make sure you watch the previous video. So we're going to load that file from our file system. Let's say, OK, this is and our user's home directory, and it's in a CSV file called titanic.csv. All right. Okay, we can have a quick look just to make sure everything worked. Perfect. All right, the data was read in. The first command we will have a look at is the select method. This allows us to select a subset of columns in our data frame. But before I do so, let's have a quick word on how Spark actually works. Now, Spark uses immutability. That means that if you invoke some method on your data frame, it will not change the existing data frame. Instead, it will return a new data frame. If you come from a more object-oriented language like Java, this might make you a bit uncomfortable. However, Scala, the language Spark is written in, really encouraged developers to embrace immutability and a functional style of programming. And a hallmark of functional programming is the absence of side effects, meaning that your programs are structured such that you invoke a function and you get something back. If you don't assign that to anything, it is gone. Let me show you what I mean by means of a quick example. Assume that you only want the name and survive columns. And the command for that is pretty easy. So you say Titanic, which is the data frame you want to work on. Then you select, you say select, and then you just enter the names of the columns. So name and survived and show. All right. So as you can see, uh, it did what we wanted it to do. However, if you take a look into the Titanic data frame again, you will notice that nothing has changed. So let's have a look at the Titanic data frame again. So nothing changed. Hence, if you want your changes to persist, you should overwrite the Titanic data frame. Of course, you can also give a list to the select method. This is especially useful if you want to choose columns programmatically. For example, the following command does also work. So you can say titanic.select and then insert a list and name survived. All right, and let's show that. All right, that also worked. This is especially useful if you want to create a list of columns out of hundreds via list comprehension. Closely related to select is the drop method. It does the exact opposite of select. It drops columns. For example, let's say you're not interested in the number of siblings and relatives on board. You could remove those columns like so. Also, we're going to overwrite the Titanic dataset since we don't want them to be in our data frame. So let me make sure that I spell the column names correctly. So we have siblings, spouses on board. Uh, let me clear the screen and do that again. All right, so we say Titanic is equal to Titanic. So we are going to overwrite the data frame and then drop. And what columns do we want to drop? Well, we want to drop this column right over there and that column. All right. So we overwrote the data frame and let's show that data frame again. And as you can see, the columns don't exist any longer. Now I've entered two commands. Since the last command shows the data with all the mentioned columns, uh, the changes are permanent. Of course, there have been no changes to the underlying CSV file. Changes on the file system will only happen if we decide to write the data frame. However, that we will do at the very end of this video series. 
Next, we will take a look at the filter method, which is equivalent to the where command in SQL. Well, it does what it says it does, it's filtering rows. However, before we use that method, let me import something from PySport. So I'm gonna import something, and say import pyspark.sql.functions as f. Now here I import um, the functions from pyspark.sql and give it the name f. Functions contains a whole bunch of different functions that you will use whenever you do anything query related. I can imagine writing a script that wrangles data which doesn't make use of the functions. All right, let's say we want to query for all females on board. Here's how we would do that. So we just want to have the females on board. We're gonna say Titanic, and I'm gonna use the filter method. And we say f call sex is equal to female. And let's show that. All right. So maybe the impression inside the filter method needs a bit more explanation. So I'm talking about that over there. Inside the functions object, there is a class called call. So this right here, right? So call is inside the functions class. And it represents a single column. Hence f call sex, so this right over there, represents the sex column inside the data frame we invoked the filter method on. Next, I create an expression which should give back some Boolean value. So this is basically just an expression which should give back a Boolean value. Here I test for equality to the value female. Note how I did not include any function. I just put in the string female. So I didn't say f lit female, I just said female. F call is necessary since you need some way to tell Spark that you're talking about a column. Saying something like, I don't know, sex equals female, that of course will always be wrong since they are both strings. So this is always false, right? Of course, we can build very complex expressions. For example, let's say we want to query for females in first class. So we would say Titanic filter. I like to put those filter expressions into parentheses and we say f call sex is equal to female. So we already know about that. And f call p class should be equal to one. And let's show that. All right, so those are only females in first class. As you can see, I put both expression inside a pair of parentheses and put an end sign in between them. The parentheses are not really necessary in that case, but I prefer a, a few parentheses too many than uh, a few parentheses too few. You could also use an or expression or both. For example, let's say we look for females in first class or males in third class. So that's pretty complicated, right? So we say Titanic filter and the first filter will be, so I have a lot of those. So sex is equal to female, all right. And f call p class is equal to one. And that is one expression. Ah, let me sh make sure that we have enough, yep. All right. Or f call sex is equal to male. And f call P class is equal to three. All right, that's a lot. Let's hope that worked. Yeah, that worked. Great. Wow, that was actually a pretty long command. However, it gave us what we wanted. So Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet should definitely be somewhere inside that data frame. 
Okay, next on sorting your data. For that, we can use the sort method on our data frame. If you want to simply sort by one column in ascending order, it is actually pretty easy to do. So we could say, for example, titanic, oops, titanic dot sort h and show the data. So this command is going to sort the passengers by age, starting with the youngest. Um, of course, we could change that. If you want to sort in a descending order, there are two ways you could do that. Um, the following command will sort your data frame again by age. However, this time in a descending order. So you could say titanic.sort age ascending is false. And let's show that. All right, so this one is starting with the oldest one. You might ask, what if I want to sort some columns in ascending order and some columns in descending order? Well, for that, we can use the DESC function inside functions. For example, let's say we want to sort by P class in an ascending order and then by H in a descending order. Also, we might want to save the result in a data frame. Well, you could do it like that. So I'm gonna create a new data frame and say Titanic sorted is equal to Titanic sort we're going to say P class. Now remember, we want to sort P class in ascending order, so nothing changes. And then we're going to use the DESC function in functions. And we're just going to give it the column name. So we're going to use H. And then, oh, no, not showing, of course, because we want to save that. All right, then we can take a look at the data frame we've just created. So let's have a look. All right, so we have P class is one, and we're starting with the oldest passenger. Great. Now that you know how to select columns, filter rows, and sort by values, you know uh, the very basics of interacting with data frames. You're going to use those me methods in pretty much every application you will ever write. In the upcoming section, we will learn how to aggregate our data.